Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the first webinar in our IPM Symposium series, Nurturing Nature in New Ways to Manage Pests. We have a great speaker today, Janet Hurley. Janet facilitates school IPM coordinator trainings for public schools in Texas and oversees the statewide effort to educate schools about their integrated pest management programs. Janet is also the co-chair for the 11th International IPM Symposium, slated for March 3rd through 6th, 2025 in San Diego, California. Before I pass it over to you, Janet, I want to let you all know that we will have a question and answer session at the end. So please put your questions in the chat. I will now pass it over to you, Janet. do a little bit of, of history working. First, who am I, what am I? Because for a lot of y'all, some people know who I am. Some people are like, who's this lady? A little bit about our history of pesticide use and stewardship in the USA, mostly because this is the country we live in, but it helps set up where we are going. Others around the world have made similar decisions but I, of course, am only familiar with the United States. History of the symposium. We're going to dive into this a little bit because there's some mentors that shared some information and there's ways for y'all to get it, but we'll talk about it. Some basics of IPM and then challenging y'all for where we're going to go forward. So who am I? Well, that four-year-old little girl that's sitting up in the corner, if you had told her then what I'd be doing now, I, I really don't think I'd have believed you. I mean, I went to school as a non-traditional, wanted to be going to the medical professions, didn't quite make it. So I have an associate's degree in business, a bachelor's degree in community health, and a master's in public administration. And in between the bachelor's and the master's in 2001, I applied for a position with, then it was Texas Agricultural Extension Service for a grant. There were two grants given out by EPA back then to start these technical resource centers. There was the Midwest and the Southwest. Well, the Midwest was Purdue, and the gentleman that oversaw that, his name is Al Fournier, and he can be found now in Arizona and does a lot of statistical stuff, but he does more ag than urban. Myself, I stayed on, had no idea what I was doing, but thought, okay, we'll try this. And what I mean by that is, Understanding school IPM in Texas was quite a deep dive into a social look at how we do IPM. Because I remember when my mentor, my friend, and the gentleman that hired me, Dr. Mike Merchant, told me, he goes, well, I can teach you how to kill a bug. He says, but getting these people to understand IPM is something else. And he is not kid. He wasn't kidding then. And as I tell you guys on this journey today, still not kidding now. I over time I became personally fascinated by roof rats because I deal with them. Since then, I mean, I knew I met Bobby Corrigan early in my career, along with Dawn and Mark Lame and Tom Green. But y'all the rat thing took me into a whole different world. And then one of the things that Dr. Merchant wanted to do before he retired was come up with this IPM experience house training for pest management professionals, but we've also used it for master gardeners. We use it also for public health, meaning code enforcement to try and train with a hands-on formulation with showing examples of good and examples of bad. Since 2017, I've been hosting an annual rodent academy. It's three days of crazy fun. And then um, what I do for, for AgriLife Extension 
is help with our IPM program statewide. I work with our state IPM coordinator, coordinator, Dr. David Kearns, especially for some of you when I say EIP. Just so you know, a history in the world of Janet, she started, she was fresh, young, faced, moved along. This is from our symposium, but just giving you guys an idea that if your early career and you're thinking, I don't know what I'm doing, don't worry. If you're 30 something and you're thinking that, no problems. I mean, it's not until you like get 50 that you really start thinking about it, you know, and then you get recognized when you get older. So let's do our history work. Because for some of you, this may be repetitive. For some of you, you may have no idea how, how we have been doing pesticide use in our country since the time of the Civil War. Because if you look at it, the Morrell Act of 1862, well, while we were doing a lot of enacting of rules, one of those rules was, how are we going to educate a nation, a nation that is growing rapidly and we're trying to go from, you grow your own food to, well, we've got urbanization and now what? So rules and regulations help guide, They they're really designed, just so y'all know, as bumpers. If you've ever played um, bowling, if you ever participated in bowling, to give you the visual, you're a little kid and they put the air in the two gutter lanes so that when the ball hits, it bounces. Well, yes, that's what boundaries are. They're designed to kind of keep you things in the row. So when you think about it, mid 1800s we're focusing on the biology and the behavior of insects i mean a lot of things were coming we had these first naturalists we had these people like darwin there was all of this information and yet what we were learning was hmm bugs bugs behave differently depending on where you're at and depending on what they're doing and what's going on You'll notice a thing. In the late 1800s, almost to the 18, 1889, so probably by 1900, this is when Congress changed certain things politically so that we had these cabinet level departments that would answer to Congress about what they're doing and how they're doing with the dollars appropriated to them, still to this day. By 1910, we decided that we needed to have um, the first Pesticide Act, and I will go into what that was. By 1993, we, we again needed to help our, our fellow farmers with creating this Division for Crop and Livestock Estimates. Again, enter agricultural economics. Because again, how do we make something productive? What does it take? Where do those thresholds come from? Then in 1947, that first act, the FIA of 1910, becomes FIFRA in 1947, okay? Pause and think about this, 1947, hmm, just had a second war. We'll talk about that too. And then 1970, the Environmental Quality Improvement Act. So the beginning of the modern pesticide era. First of all, and this really begun and a lot of those early rules in the early 1900s, if you look at what they were doing and how they based their foundation, it was really based on making sure that the snake oil salesman or woman wasn't harming 
the customer. We wanted to make sure that if we were putting things out there for human consumption, then making sure that there were certain standards. 1910, I mean, stop and think about just medicine. Think about science. Think about where we were at. I mean, it, you think about this and in, in, in 2024, you're thinking, oh, but if you really go back in the way back machine and think about, well, the Titanic's sunk not too long after this, think about that country. Think about those people who were walking around and doing things. And then we get after the war because I really didn't want to go down the full history lesson. You want that CEU, call me later. But during World War One to World War II, science and chemistry came together for a lot of different reasons. One, public health. One of the reasons we had so many deaths in World War One and while World War II, DDT was used really well was because we had service people dying out in the field because of vector-borne diseases, okay? Best way to eradicate fleas, mites, body louse, all that stuff, kill them, kill them all. So yeah, that was our chemistry, but again, it was getting to a point where this is where we needed to go. We were thinking about this. And then this young lady, who was a scientist, mostly a microbiologist, um, and really did water. So she was more into that movement than, say, what you would consider an activist of today. But Rachel Carson wrote this book. And, and you got to think about this again, 1961, 1962 year I was born, the decade of coming of age of the hippie generation going into the 70s. So she writes this book and she talks about the health effects, not only on non-target organisms, but she does talk about people. She starts talking about pesticide resistance, talks about how it harms or changes secondary pests. And it started a movement. Wasn't a pretty movement, but it was a movement. Because again, we're learning, oh, the people can revolt. And when the people revolted, and, and, and you look at this kind of timeline, 1970 must have been a really big year. I vaguely remember it. I mean, as a kid, the best thing I remember about the, the early 70s was going to the moon, okay? But Earth Day, I remember that. But I mean, I remember Woodsy the Owl and Smokey the Bear and being the one going home and talking to parents about this. But I also grew up in New England and they were kind of already conscientious. But that was the 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 year that everything really kind of changed because we get this new agency, we get these new rules, and then you get this Council on Environmental Quality in 1972 that starts poking at the integrated pest management. Because again, we're using what I deem, because this is sometimes in the world I work in, people call up and go, well, I just need to know what I can use to kill said blah. Well, it doesn't always work that way, folks. So this integrated pest management is an approach that employs a combination of techniques to control the wide variety of potential pests that may threaten crops. Now, granted, this is the 70s. We weren't thinking indoors or anything by them. We were more worried about our agricultural commodities because 
that's where it first began. So, again, we already had FIFRA, but in 1972, it moved FIFRA from Department of Ag over to the, this new agency, the Environmental Protection Service, okay? And, and it shifted its emphasis to protecting the environment and public health, because, again, while we were thinking about what it was doing, the book raised the concerns and the public raised the concerns. It wasn't just one book. There were a lot of people, scientists included, going, she's on to something, so we better look at it. Again, the Clean Water Act, which has changed multiple times since 1972 as well. So what was fit for task to do? When I do um, CEU talks, especially with our private applicators, the and the our private applicators in Texas, just so y'all know, these are the ladies and gentlemen that have production. They work out in acres of row crops, cattle, you name it. So there's a lot that they they are tasked to do, and one of them is what is, why do we have these regulations and why do I need to know? Well, this plays into where we're going in the future, but EPA is to assess potential risks the pesticides pose to humans, the environment, and wildlife and weigh these against their benefits, taking action against those for which the risks outweigh the benefits. Can I tell y'all that doing a cost benefit analysis, I don't care what you're doing, is hard. Putting it in a term that says we've created this, this new chemi chemistry to take care of this type of insect, but now I need to figure out what is its long-term effects, isn't quite as easy as looking in the crystal ball going mirror, mirror on the wall. So that's first. In 1988, Congress amended the pesticide registration provisions requiring that re-registration. It was redone again in 1996 under the Food Quality Protection Act and then recently amended in 2012. And no one's allowed to take me to court, but I believe we will probably see some others in the future. So let's talk about the history of IPM. These two gentlemen right here are, are behind a lot of what, oh, wait a second. I'm looking at the wrong slide. These two right here are behind a lot of the information I'm about to share. I know they got it from him. So, and Don, you can populate names. The history of IPM, born to address pesticide issues out of discontent with a purely insecticidal approach. Hmm. Sound like a book that we all knew? Because these scientists, when they were young gentlemen in the 70s, they were coming up going, wait a second, this isn't, some of this isn't working. Because if you're killing bad bugs, aren't you killing good bugs? So reducing the emphasis on insecticide under the eye and then actually looking at integrated. How do we look at the pest management of an aphid or a beetle or a bow weevil? And what is it going to take to eradicate it? One of the first projects, which was, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, Huffaker Huffaker project was in the mid seventies. And what this group was tasked with was looking at disrupting. And, and I got to just read it to you because when I read this, I was like, hmm, 
some of these words just keep resonating. At a time when solutions were being sought to minimize environmental disruption by the wide use of pesticides, this project made significant advances in timely use of insecticides, monitoring development of insect resistant crops, biological control, and methods for evaluating IPM programs. Y'all, this is what we do every day in most of what we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. Trying to find that solution to a problem that isn't always easy. So this project was jointly funded by three different agencies, had 18, sta 18 states, 300 scientists. And we still do some of this today. It was a multidisciplinary approach. That's why you look at when we have calls for grants, especially when it's in a research, we want multiple or even extension and education. Multidisciplinary, why? Because we understand IPM is a big circle. So the early area of early area early era of IPM, going to the 60s through the 80s, another good mentor of mine in this image, that would be Dr. Pete Goodell, who got me on this rodeo anyways. Um, but technologies pioneered by agricultural IPM specialist. Part of that was the sampling innovations. I mean, prior to the 60s, for some of you, if you are Gen X or younger, you, yellow cards, blue cards, sticky cards, pheromone based, all of that, that wasn't standard practice back in the 70s and 80s. Baits, oh my gosh. Even when baits came on the market for structural pest control, when I was first starting, People would look at us like we were crazy. Insect growth regulators, birth control for bugs, repellents and attractants. We have learned because the pheromones are attractants, what do they do? Either disrupt or bring in. Thresholds, we could spend days on this, but basically why apply something if it doesn't need to be given? For instance, my running joke when I do school IPM is don't understand why people apply pesticides to baseboards because baseboards never did anything to them. Okay, so when would I need to use something inside a building? Well, something may be coming in up under a baseboard, but what is it? Generally, it's ants in our case. And if it is the ants are really outdoors, it's a sign that something's going on. Right? problem solving. We came up with the new, um, the synergized pyrethrins, pyrethroids. We've looked at genetic control and biological control. I mean, nothing's off the table even now. We still have these. We still use them. We are still advancing with this. But it's a multiply disciplined approach with multiple control tactics. So if you look at it graphically, because I had to give you guys some kind of graphics for this, I really wanted to do images and it just wasn't working for Janet. But the term integrated pest management was first used. Now, there are some of y'all watching who argue that IPM is the wrong definition. We need to come up with a set assessment. It's sustainable, it's green. It's problem solving. And I only wanna solve pest problems, not everyone's problems. How's that? So again, IPM thrown in to another national policy. So why Nixon was creating EPA, there was still movement afoot with the ag and the USDA people 
on IPM on that side of the house. It wasn't like, oh, we're just going to come over here and do this. No, we were trying to get more. Then by 1979, President Carter says, you know what? I need a federal IPM coordinating committee because, again, we should be doing, we should be setting a tone. A good leader sets tone. And what I mean by that is this, I will lead by example and or a lot of times a leader, I'll get dirty right with you. I tell a lot of people most of the time, I will get down and get dirty with you. I'm just not able to crawl on roofs and crawl spaces like I used to. Nothing. 20 years ago, not a problem. Nowadays, roofs kind of scare me. Crawl spaces... And then again, 1980s, who adopted the first one? The National Park Service. The National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Forestry Service, very, very much supporters of IPM because of what they are doing, trying to preserve our ecosystem, correct? So coming from the Texas A&M University system, and if you know anything, if you went to school and took a class, because I remember when I started, and to this day, Dr. Atkinson is the guy. He's right up there with Bolog at A&M on setting a complete tone and tenor different for how we do our agriculture. And and here's my precursor audience. Who's gonna be the next one? Because again, they were the first to deduce that most plant pests could be controlled by best by managing practices and by maximizing controls that already exist in nature. They called it supervised insect control. Call it what you will. Janet? So the CI, huh? Oh, sorry. I just want to give you a time check. You've got 32 minutes. Oh, we're fine. Great. So moving along, Adkinson included all pest control disciplines. It was the first project that was really funded. And the reason I'm bringing this up, y'all, is you need to understand we still fund. Then this group. And it scares the bejesus out of me that when I was pulling this together, I remember when I first went to my first national IPM coordinating committee meeting and it was in DC and I was such a green kid and I go now and it's like old home week and I get to see people retire, new folks come in. But the thing that's the most important about this committee and the work we do in IPM is it's interdisciplinary. Cannot stress this enough. It is interdisciplinary. So that group decided on a whim, oh, let's have this, let's have this conference. Let's have let's have this workshop. And in 1989, they all went to Vegas. They were really targeting research for IPM. Had 500 participants. You can see who made it up because you're going to see a trend. But the outcomes brought everybody together, identified needs and mechanisms because that's the only way to do it. And the resounding outcome from that first meeting was we like these meetings, we like coming together, but can we only do it every two to three years? Because again, I mean, all of us are busy, we're doing stuff. So this is where the genesis of this symposium came from. So what did we say at that meeting? I didn't say anything, I wasn't there. But we need to restructure, and we, X, FYI, we call this NIPMAC, National IPM Coordinating Committee. And um, I... 
I will get, leave the other ones to, to the extension service, pesk management subcommittee. They also had a task force, and then they committed, continued to meet and bring about uh, symposia. The other thing that was kind of big was, all right, a couple of years later, they decided to do a national IPM forum in D.C. because that's where the, the policymakers live. Again, brought USDA and EPA together. Took two years of planning, 10 committees, and one major research conference. But as Frank Zollum said, their wings spread. Because again, it identified those constraints and, a, and then led to regional work shops, led to books, and then led to some additional goal setting in the early 2000s. At the same time, we're moving along and then in the real world, while Washington's doing their thing, you see this, we've created a new chemistry. We created another new chemistry. And as things chugged along, then we started seeing seed changes and then we see resistance popping up. Nothing new, nothing un unusual. So back to your federals, here's the group. These are all of the agencies that literally belong in IPM. So let's everybody get on the same page. What is IPM? Effectively an environmentally sound approach to pest management. Integrated, prevention, cultural, chemical, aims to suppress pest populations below economic threshold. Call it whatever you will, but I mean, again, you're trying, even if you do structural pest control, you're still trying to keep the customer happy. Essential ingredients. I start with all of my stuff with IPM, know thy bug, know thy rat, know thy enemy, whatever. You got to inspect, monitor, or scout. You're going to need thresholds to guide the response because what is it, where is it, why is it? You got to document, document, document. Sanitation and waste management, okay? It's part of the problem issue solution. Maintenance and pest proofing, especially if it's mammals. Selecting management and methods and products, you got to know where you're at in relation to the country and what is going on. Education and communication and evaluation. So IPM control methods. Again, Great graphic that was given to me by Dr. Chrissy Seegers, but created by CropWalk. But we all know these, genetic, cultural, behavior, biological, physical, chemical. How many of you seen one of these and gone? Because depending on who you are, where you're at, and and I really have gone more to this one up in the, the roundy circle is IPM is one big roundy loop. I mean, it's the wheel of time. Genetic control. So we've started, started changing things, changing different cultivars, disease resistance, insect resistance, biological controls, you know, do we have too many? Do we not have enough? I mean, this is again. Preventive controls. It's the seeds. It, and landscape, cleaning equipment. I mean, you look at some of this stuff and you go, huh. Scouting. Two of my favorite little IPM agents, especially this one back here on on the rig carry, but doing scouting. One of the things that we do, I mean, 
constantly, constantly is set up scouting schools. You'd be surprised. I mean, the next generation doesn't know what the first, and, and things have changed. And now we have these things called drones. Drones can do things that humans can't. They can see things up above. And I couldn't find the right images. That's why. But why is it so hard to adopt? I mean, you look at some of this stuff and you think, oh, you know, IPM, IPM in a greenhouse should be easy. All depends on where the greenhouse is at. Who's keeping up? Do you have enough people? I mean, everything. Oh, we shouldn't have any problems with, with critters. Well, if this is the only place to put your dumpsters, you may. Um, if this is an account you're trying to service, it may be difficult. So again, how hard? Well, here's your challenges, because this is where we're going. Climate variability. One minute it's warm, the next minute it's cold. One minute it's dry, the next minute it's snowing. I mean, Pops Tony Phil said we were going to have an early spring. He was fooling us. Pesticide resistance, biological controls, invasive species, and emerging pathogen and vectors. So climate. Each area has some type of ongoing or starting to get some type of problem. In ag, it, it, it could be lack of water, could be too much, could be changing soil, changing temperatures. I mean, a lot of things are changing in our country. Forestry, again, because of things changing, are there new insects? Is it because of disease? Is it because it's too hot? Because we get snowmageddon? Public health, the changing, the changing way, ever changing way of insect behavior. And then these goals and developed by different levels of government trying to, to, to help do their part. But what is it and how is it? This was the only slide, y'all, but I really wanted to throw in and throw in one of those polls that you guys could give me like all the words because when you think resistance and think resistance in what you do day to day day to day do you see an insecticide resistance do you see um, a herbicide resistance do you see a particular plant that's resistant to whatever you're trying to do i mean there is so much under this ball and yet, there are smart minds out there who are thinking about how do we address this in the future? And the future is now. Biological controls. So when, when I first began and you do structural pest control and you say, yeah, we're going to do some biological controls and everybody goes, oh, ladybugs for aphids. And you've been doing this for a while and you think of one of your award winners that was doing sterile insect release up in Canada years ago. That's where my mind goes. You start looking at what is it? Is it biopesticides? Is it a living organism? Is it um, coming up with ways to vaccinate or control because in public health you know they're looking at different ways on that how is this you know what are bi biological controls and what are botanical controls because again when you're educating to different markets how do you do that and then what is that conversation because this should be a very big conversation but i guarantee you're not going to see this in a commercial on any television or documentary. Invasive species. Well, I could probably go on and on and on about invasives, but as you can see, 
we have a bunch. I mean, anywhere from disease-based to, you know, either having insects come across because I live in Texas and things like to drift north of the border to wood boring insects. I mean, nothing's as happiness like emerald ash borer or my favorite, the spotter lantern fly. And yes, my challenge to anyone can we get the guy from Saturday Night Live to show up to our event? Because yes, I mean, if anybody's got a great mascot and we weren't even asking for it, was the spotter lanternfly. Because he makes his debut on Saturday Night Live and people are all going, oh yeah, and I know what to do. It's very interesting how that message went. When we talk about messaging, we also talk about Zika. So why am I bringing all of this up? Well, see, there's this event coming up in less than a year. It is the 11th International IPM Symposium. And we are going to talk about all things IPM. And we will be in Paradise Point, San Diego, March 3rd through 6th. So who is our symposium made up of? And who are we? Well, we're a bunch of change agents. That's who we are. Most of us work in the land grant system, but we do have industry partners. We do have nonprofits. We have a variety of people who serve at a whole different level. But our committees are, we've got a steering committee, we have a program planning committee, subcommittees like posters and local arrangements, awards committee, that is something that I have chaired for a very long time. And it is the most gratifying group to be on because you get to read over your peers and then you get to recognize them. So again, nominate. The Finance Committee, yes, we try to balance a budget on, on a shoestring. Students and Early Career science, Scientists Committee, because we all know that y'all need help, and we all know that some of y'all need some boosters. We're here to help you. And then our International, because it's supposed to be international. We know that, especially just on our continent, I know that our friends in Canada and our friends in Mexico and in some of the islands that reach out on either side of us have some of the same problems, if not worse. How do we feed, clothe a population, right? So who attends? Well, Agricultural Research Services, Animal and Plant Health Inspectors, Forest Service, the National um, Statistics, these are all folks that are from Department of Ag. The EPA, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have to give a little plug for my project, the Gulf Salt Vector with Dr. Claudia Regal, whoop, whoop. Who should attend and participate? You, and what I mean by you, any, yeah, I've got research and extension, county agents, forester service. I've got our uh, ECOP people, nonprofits, pest management professionals, public health, code enforcement, fire marshal, game warden, wildlife health specialist. I would have put everybody there, but I didn't know how to do that and make it not look really messy. So here I am throwing my gauntlet. If you really want to, to know, do more, participate, be that change agent, be that chaos coordinator, then volunteer to be on our one of our committees. When the abstracts and the poster nominations come out um, later this spring, submit. Are you thinking about a team, a coworker, or a lifetime achiever? Those will definitely come out towards the end of 
May 1st of June, you'll have the summer to work on the packets. And then come fall, the committee and I will set about ranking. And FYI, we hope to let everybody who submits for something to know, to know if you'll be traveling by November. Because we understand between November and March, getting tickets, getting things. And if you're someone internationally and you're thinking you need to um, get extra support, let us know by clicking on um, either scanning this QR code. And I don't think you can click on the link, but at the very least, we can drop that in the chat and let us know. And we will be happy to put you on our sign up list get you hooked up i can stop talking now not sure if we have any questions thank you janet i was fast and furious it was great um I don't see any questions in the chat so i just want to invite people if you have any questions about anything that janet covered um, now would be a great time to throw it in the chat. Yeah, Kelly did throw a link to the Survey Monkey um, in the chat. We will be sending that out to all of you. Everyone who registered will be receiving the survey link in, in an email as well. So if you missed it, um, you can look for it there. Uh, we did record the, we are recording this webinar and that will be, we aren't going to be sending it out to you all in an email, but it will be posted to the symposium website in April. And then you will all receive a notification when it's posted there. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add or Janet, otherwise I was just gonna say um, thank you to you, Janet, and thanks to everyone who was able to attend today. And please take the time to fill out the survey if you're not sure how you wanna help. There's an option for a comments in the bottom. And if you're kind of wanna just throw out there how you think you could help, if you don't think it's reflected in the survey, please please make a note there and we can always connect with you individually. Um, we We welcome any and all and people interested in it. Oh. Great. Oh, wait, it's, I see I see something in a Q&A. Nurturing nature to manage pests, what are your suggestions? Well, Melissa, that one, you know, it's interesting because yes, I put that in here because it all depends. I mean, are you, is it a specific pest in a specific place or is it just a general? And Jeff, you've got another question. I see What's that. that. Okay. I think I got it. Um, all right, Robert. So wider adoption. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh. Okay. So Jeff, the first barrier work. Most people have an innate belief. And I find this with a lot of different things. It's the silver bullet syndrome of, of our culture. I want something and I want it gone and I want it gone now, or I want it done now. So part of that is that nature of, let me get it, how do I get it done? So that barrier, because the other barrier is, especially if I'm dealing with schools or structural pest control is, well, that's not my job. I, I just do. And yet when I look at folks and when I train for IPM, 
it's everyone's job. We all have a role. And I would definitely say my third one is sometimes we overthink. With IPM, it's a step process. What is it? Where is it? Why is it? And then is it really a pest or is it a nuisance? And then if it's a pest, what are the steps that I need to get rid of it? Okay, anything else? And Deb, thank you for the wheel. I mean, FYI, y'all, when I was doing the IPM slide of the pyramids and stuff, it's like, I could make this so nauseating because I cannot tell you how many pyramid images I have, wheel images, different, and yet they all have applicability. And yet the one thing that, I, like I said, I go back to when I do school IPM training, which is what I do on Wednesday and Thursday this week, is it may be this this time and it may be this this time because right now in Texas, FYI, first day of spring, yeah, we are in full spring. Well, we have crane flies. Well, there's nothing chemically I need to do with a crane fly. But by gosh, by golly, you can be out there working in the yard and they get in your face. And what do you want to do? You know, swat them away or spray them away. Well, there's not much I can do other than go, please, weather change. But then again, I don't. I don't want it to get that hot. So you endure. Okay. That's another question, another question, but it looks more like a co comment than a question. It's thanks, Janet. I love your stepped process, especially the pest versus nuisance. We'll encourage that with our jumping worm invasive. Oh, the jumping worm. And remember, it depends. Mind you, I mean, depending on who your audience is and how they perceive. I've noticed a lot of people, just FYI, that have moved from the West Coast to Texas or from the North down here and, and seeing our insect diversity. And I tell everybody, I said, it, it is so different. I mean, in the South, seeing an American cockroach, yeah. You, I mean, that's like summer. It's a summer tradition right next to mosquitoes. Y'all up north, if you saw an American cockroach every August, you'd probably faint. But it's, you know, what is your perspective? Where are you? What is it? And then what is going on? I mean, y'all, I could go on for days of how many times I watch all the environmental stuff going. I don't know how we move forward, y'all. This is where we want you, you to help us. I'm an old woman. Well, not quite. All right. Anything else? Yeah, there's a, a comment from Amanda. I appreciated your comment about the SNL skit. Are there other ways you or other agencies have thought to advertise IPM slash pests to the general public? Any suggestions? Yes. So I have seen skits locally. I've seen I mean, the reason the the this, this SNL guy gets to me is back in 2018 at that symposium, we had a couple of people dress up in costume. And I think it was the Emerald Ash Borer. It was Rebecca Wallace. And, but she was a hit. My friend, Dr. Claudia Regal down in the city of New Orleans, she does a bug fest. They dress, and I mean, they go full out, granted, they're in New Orleans, but they have rat costumes, butterfly costumes, you know, mosquito costumes, but they use that to engage. If you don't feel comfortable, what I tell everybody is 
go find you a county extension agent and see if you can't get one of them involved, especially if she's family and consumer science. Ag and natural resource, those guys, eh, but those FCSH people. Now, Mark. Such a good question with so many. IPM is too much to too many people that if you were to try, I mean, we thought we were having troubles in the nineties, getting it through and getting it through in 2000. I couldn't even imagine Congress tackling that sucker right now. Huh. Bless their hearts, but they, they couldn't. To answer your question, Tim, yes. So um, one of our turf grass specialists, Dr. Chrissy Seegers, but um, I mean, Casey Reynolds, there's a lot, there's a lot in our Aggie turf because we have to look at it. Diseases and weeds go hand in hand with everything else. Yes, I use insects, but if I'm talking public health, I talk about a lot more vectors and diseases. If I'm talking to turf people, I'm talking about take all and, you know, thrips or Bermuda stem maggot. I mean, it's out there. It's just, again, you bring up the one point that, that most people bring up the silo. Because it really is, if I was gonna go out and balance something, it should be at the turf level and then that would help lead to the, the plants level and everything else because it all boils down to what are you eating and drinking? Because it, it's the same with humans as it is with our environment. What's going in and how are you dealing with it? Okay. How are we on time? Whoop. We're two minutes. Yeah, it looks like we got you got all those questions. I just saw the time. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Janet, and thanks for everyone who was able to attend today. Um, like I said, I'll be sending out that we'll be sending out that survey. Please take the time. It's not a very long survey. Please take the time to fill it out and look for the link to the recording on our website and hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much.